for anybody that's out there, we will be starting at nine o'clock. Obviously, that's what it says. There's also a handout uh, that you can download at that link that's on the on the screen right now. You know, it looks like it's nine o'clock. We've got a few people still filtering in here, but I guess uh, it's nine o'clock. Let's use the time. Let's see. I'm going to figure out a routine here. There we go. All right. Well, good morning. My name is Jeff Scott, the technical assistance engineer at Cornell Local Roads. And today we're going to talk about erosion. Uh, some of the characteristics of soils and effects on slopes and some of the things we can actually do to try to stabilize that. I'm going to start out, uh, you'll notice on your settings, I'm not sure if it's on the top or the bottom, but uh, if you have any questions, go right to the Q&A. You can type in questions, Adam and Amanda are in the background, they'll be taking care of some of that and let me know that um, I do have questions and we'll try to get them answered as we go through. So. Um, Adam, you want to put those poles up? Okay, here's a first poll is what is your primary job function? And you've probably been through this before. So I'm going to let her rip. All right. So do you stop that, Adam, or is that? Oh, poll ended. All right. So, all right. Um, again, if anybody has any questions, even after this webinar, feel free to reach out to us. We can uh, give you a hand. All right. Next question. Who do you work for? Got village and town, some state, private sector. All right, so we've got that taken care of. And is there another one, Adam, or is that? Oh, okay. one more. How, how long have you worked there? <laughs> we have some new ones and some veterans. So some of this information may not be new, but again, sometimes it's good to hear it. We have a good percentage between the five and 10 years. All right. It looks like the majority of us are between five and 10 years. There's some 10 to 20, and there's a few over three over 20 years. And one, one below one year. All right. See, can I get rid of that, Adam? 
Yeah, it's we've stopped sharing it. You can just uh, ex, uh, exit out on your own screen so it doesn't yeah, show on. Yeah, I just did that. <laughs> well, all right. Um, I guess uh, we're going to be also offering PDHs for this session for anybody who's out there with an engineer uh, engineering wants credit for that. So we'll start out with it's not working. erosion. That's pretty much the talk of our day here. Uh, obviously, erosion is nothing new. It's been around for millions of years. If anybody's been to the Grand Canyon, you can actually tell it's uh, been working steadily. Uh, and basically, all soil erosion is, is the removal of soil by water, wind, ice, and even gravity. Uh, again, we're going to focus on uh, soil erosion caused by rainfall and surface runoff. Um, and that it, it's typically uh, accelerated due to soil disturbances. Uh, when it comes to erosion, typically it's best to stop it, best to prevent it before it even happens. Uh, if you can do that, you can reduce a substantial amount of maintenance activities later on. Um, there's a, a, a approximately 30 tons of sediment material can be eroded from a mile of ditches before you can even notice it. Um, moving that material back and resetting it in 30 tons of material, it's, it's a lot of work. It's uh, time and effort. And, you now, if we can avoid that, keep the soil where it is, um, we're going to be a lot better off. So let's look at some of the types we've got here. Uh, these will be the ones we'll probably talk about most here. They're not the only ones. Um, but essentially, it's a natural breakdown of the Earth's surfaces. Uh, you saw with the Grand Canyon, uh, the Appalachian Mountains uh, uh, have eroded over time. Uh, even the Rockies are doing their erosion particularly now. Uh, there's three types, four types here, raindrop, surface, rill, and gully. Um, and essentially, where we are, uh, raindrop erosion. Essentially, basically, all that is is where the raindrop comes down out of the sky and hits the ground. Uh, open soil, dislodges small, tiny particles in that soil. Uh, and once it's been dislodged, it can be uh, picked up with the flow as it's going. Um, and you say, how can a raindrop do that? But it actually hits the ground at about 25 to 30 feet per second. So it's moving and it does have some force behind it. Uh, even though it is a tiny little thing, it can dislodge that. Um, that soil, once it gets dislodged, it can be picked up by uh, accumulating runoff. And that's where we get the surface erosion, typically a sheet flow, where you've picked up a lot of that sediment as it's going along. If you get a lot of sleep, sleep sheet, mm, sheet flow, you can actually pick up larger particles as well and start dislodging and uh, causing worse situations. Once it starts to get a little, the sheet flow starts to channelize, uh, you start to get these little rills. Uh, and they're basically just uh, little tiny ditches, essentially, where the water is concentrated and started to. Uh, started to erode out in a channel as opposed to a surface. Um, it can be six inches deep. Uh, you know, they, they, they kind of keep digging until they go. And in certain situations, they'll just collapse on themselves. In other situations, they'll just get worse. They'll end up with gullies. Uh, and that's kind of what we have here. We've got a gully here. And this is actually a gully that happened and that occurred after a heavy rainstorm uh, in the Ithaca area. So it's basically, it's a combination of the real and the concentrated flows to form these gullies. Uh, again, if they're left untended, you're gonna get the worst case scenario. You're gonna to start to road out like this, or you're gonna get the Grand Canyon over time. There's also stream erosion. We're not really gonna get into that a whole lot, but uh, again, as that water flow comes through here, um, the, the volume and velocity, typically the key for erosion when it comes to water is the volume and the velocity of that flow going through there. And basically, it's taking out all the fines. It's causing a larger material to be there, but it's not strong enough to support the vegetation. So they collapse in there, and the next flow comes through, and those trees end up near culverts. Uh, so we can try to stabilize that. It's going to be a good idea. Uh, of course, along streams, it's going to be a lot more difficult because a lot of it's private land. Um, there's also dust erosion. And there's basically uh, particles are dislodged by the wind, picked up by the wind, and uh, carried away. Uh, we don't see a lot of these out west. We do. Um, I've encountered several of these. They're they're not a lot of fun, um, and it's again not a new thing. If anybody's familiar with the '30s and the Dust Bowl, this is uh, this is what Oklahoma looked like after all the, the the soil got picked up and carried east. So again, there's a variety of different types. This will be type. This will be the type of dust that we're typically going to deal with. And basically, this material right here coming off of the road, those are our fines that hold that road together. Uh, that serves as a binder with a little bit of moisture. So as we lose that, those dust particles, those small 
um, earth particles basically dislodge and then end up into the vegetation on the on the trees in a variety of different places. When the rain comes, then it becomes mobile. Uh, so then it becomes sediment and travels down. Um, and speaking of sediment, sediment can come in a variety of things. Typically it's material that's moved uh, and then deposit at some location downstream as that velocity decreases, uh, its ability to carry those uh, particles decreases as well. So then you, um, they start to fall out by weight. Um, they fall the smaller ones go down lower and further down, the larger ones drop out pretty quick. So again, these can cause a variety of different problems. Um, they can fill culverts and ditches and stream beds and even lakes. So if we can stop the erosion before it starts, it's gonna be a lot, uh, a lot more effective and a lot less work. Uh, and sometimes it's just, um, it's just sediment that's picked up along roadways. Um, typically it comes, you know, in this case, it was collected by a uh, central storm sewer system that had basically collected and then discharged into this river here. Uh, again, it's still, uh, still not the best thing, but if we can try to avoid that, you can see the sediment in this river here. Uh, and where do these sediment go? Well, they go out into the lakes or wherever they're being discharged. Uh, in this case, you can see it's just coming right out. There's kind of a plume here. It dissipates, but it's still, there's sediment in there. Still causing problems. And then worst case scenario, uh, this is the lower end of Cayuga Lake in the inlet. And you can see where the sediment is basically really doing substantial damage. Um, well, it's, it's, it's substantially covering that water area. Uh, the damage itself comes from that sediment starts to settle out. Uh, not only does it cloud the vegetation when it's in this condition, but as it settles out, it covers that vegetation and there's a lot of aquatic environment, uh, aquatic animals that are in there, uh, small invertebrates. So when that sediment, uh, sediment starts covering them, uh, basically smothers them right out. So there's some environmental impacts as well. Now, some other issues, uh, that sediment as it travels down basically can pick up pollutants, a variety of different types of pollutants, the, the, the nutrients, phosphorus, nitrogen, um, you get the heavy metals, you get the petroleum products, um, salt, anything that can be picked up and carried with the rainwater basically it adheres to the sediment. Um, it serves as a um, basically a transfer mechanism. Um, and again, it can impact the aquatic life. Uh, in this case right here in the picture on the right, um, you've got an algae bloom here. That's basically a freshwater pond where you've gotten phosphorus is collected uh, within the rainwater, essentially fertilize the algae in it. Um, the algae grows extremely fast, creating an algae bloom. And as it does that, as it grows, it gobbles up oxygen out of the water itself. Uh, once it blooms, it shields the vegetation below and uh, causes that uh, vegetation to basically uh, decrease its production of oxygen. Uh, so you kind of get a double whammy as far as decreasing the uh, dissolved oxygen within the water itself. So that can impact the aquatic life as well. Um, as it, as it, this algae bloom decays, it becomes toxic. Um, and of course, by, while it's decaying, it's also gobbling up water or oxygen as well. Um, but it becomes toxic and it can cause a lot of problems if you were um, swimming in it or if you have it as a drinking water source. So there's a lot of problems associated with the uh, pollutants and the stuff that carry in that runoff. So again, if we can keep that sediment to a minimum, it's going to reduce the potential for carrying a lot of these uh, other things that are in there. As I mentioned, calcium too, the salts, uh, calcium chlorides, if rain hits them, can pick them right up, take them right through there, get carried by the uh, sediment as well. Um, a little bit of, uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of that sodium content or the, cal the salt content to basically change the environment in a small stream. So if we can avoid that, um, we're gonna be a whole lot better off. <clears throat> so what are the factors that influence uh, erosion itself? Um, well, Right here, there's about five of them. Soil erodibility, and we'll talk about these a little bit more in depth. Vegetated cover, the topography, the climate, and the season. Uh, soil erodibility, basically, that's uh, the vulnerability of soil to erosion. Um, it takes into consider the soil structure, the texture, and the percentage of organic matter within there. Um, typically, most erodible soils contain high proportions of silt and very fine sand. Obviously, they're, they're smaller, they're lighter, they're easier to transport. Uh, often the presence of clay or organic matter, matter will tend to decrease its soil erodibility. Uh, so it's important to keep that in there as far as good topsoil. Uh, clays tend to be sticky and tend to bind the particles together and kind of hold it together, similar to the surface of a road 
we got those fine materials uh, holding that surface as a binder. There's erosion risk. Again, this table is right out of the blue book. Uh, I would recommend if you have any questions or anything like that, then um, a lot of these are answered within the blue book themselves, but it basically talks about the erosion risk, different types of soils, uh, gravelly, non-cohesive, sandies, fine, with fines, silty clay, and then dispersive clays, but depending on the slope, it's gonna vary on how quick it's gonna erode. So if you'll notice the gravel, and typically they're heavier particles, larger particles, uh, pretty much a lower erodibility, but on steep slopes, pretty much everything's gonna get going. Vegetative cover. Um, basically protects the soil from erosive forces, uh, the raindrop impact plus the runoff scour. Uh, several ways, the top growth itself shields that surface from the raindrop impact, while the root mass holds that soil particles in place. Uh, grass buffer strips, uh, they can be used as filtering, uh, used to filter the sediment from the runoff. Um, as that flow goes through that grass, basically it'll slow that velocity down. Uh, and again, it's, it'll help filter out a lot of that sediment that's going through that. Uh, the roots of that soil or the vegetation right there as well will uh, improve its infiltration capacity into the soil itself. So one of the um, one of the most important things if we can basically uh, to stop erosion would be to vegetate. Uh, it's one of the reasons that the DEC is pushing for the vegetation on any open sites. Uh, again, typically depends on where it is, but typically the maximum any kind of open site should be left is 14 days. Uh, otherwise vegetated, even if it's just temporary grass, it's gonna minimize that erosion and save a whole lot of troubles downstream. Topography as well. Um, the slope length and the steepness can greatly influence both the velocity and the volume of the surface runoff. <clears throat> if you've got long slopes, basically there's a lot of time to collect a lot more runoff. Uh, so as it collects it and discharges it at the bottom of the slope, um, you're gonna have an increase in runoff. Um, the volume as far as that goes, but uh, the steeper the slope, the faster it's going to go. So you're going to have an increase in velocity. And that's really force, that's where the force comes between the volume and the velocity. That's where it starts to dislodge a lot of the larger particles. Uh, so you're going to get bas uh, basically both of them really enhance the potential for erosion. The climate basically affects erosion. Uh, it varies from area to area. Uh, rainfall characteristics directly influence the amount of runoff obviously that is generated. Uh, and it impacts such things as frequency, intensity, and duration, uh, duration of it. Uh, as the frequency increases, it decreases the potential for runoff to infiltrate back into the ground. Uh, because it is so uh, often, it can tend to go. Uh, dry situations will also do that if the ground is extremely hard. Uh, any kind of that runoff, any rain coming out of the sky is just going to hit it and keep moving and not infiltrate. It really takes time to saturate that uh, to wet up that soil so it can actually infiltrate properly. Um, the soil remained saturated for a long period of time. That was the problem we had between Irene and Lee. Uh, one storm came through, filled all the ponds and saturated the soils. Uh, the next storm came through and had nowhere to go. So it was all flooding. Uh, so saturated soils can actually cause um, an increase in potential runoff and basically uh, erosion itself. And then the duration of the rains too. If you get a long rain, long times, um, it, it has that potential for doing the same thing that the multiple storms can do. Uh, fills the soil up, fills up the ponds, creates runoff, uh, creates volumes unusual and runoff. So the climate characteristics, rainfall characteristics in specific uh, can really affect how runoff goes, uh, how it affects the runoff potential. The season itself, time of year can have a uh, seasonal variations in temperature and rainfall uh, essentially define periods of high erosion potential during the year. In spring, uh, high erosion potential is when the surface soil thaws first, but the ground underneath remains uh, solid and frozen. So as that erodes and the rainfall or anything comes on there, um, it dislodges, there's nowhere for it to actually adhere to. The water doesn't go down, the runoff doesn't go down, it just kind of runs uh, laterally as that sheet flow and it takes that soil with it. So, you know, it's taking that erosion at that same time. So even, a, even with a low intensity rainfall, that erosion can happen. In the summer months, erosion potential increases due to the more frequent and high intensity rainfalls. Um, Northeast has been experiencing 25% increase 
in uh, the high intensity rainfalls where you're getting inches of rain in minutes. Uh, right now we've got a nice calm rainfall, which hopefully it'll go on the round, ground and recharge the aquifers, but um, that high intensity rainfall can cause a lot of problems as well. <clears throat> vegetation. You're, in planting vegetation, you really need to take in several considerations, uh, whether it's a steep slope or any situation itself. Um, typically, you should evaluate the soil for the texture, actually its structure, what it's made up of, uh, and then its steepness of the slope, because that's going to impact how quick it's going to erode and the type of vegetation that's going to be able to hold it. Um, texture impacts the permeability and the water holding capacity of the soil. Uh, often topsoil must be reapplied uh, during construction site because a lot of that, um, a lot of that soil is either stripped off and stockpiled, but um, it needs to be replaced. You got to replace that organic matter basically to allow that to become fertile again. Uh, overly compacted soils need to be heat compacted. Heavy equipment can compact that top six to eight inches of material uh, to the point where the pore space is almost nil. Um, so infiltration doesn't go in, roots won't penetrate it. So overly compacted soils need to be um, need to be broken up. And I'll touch on that later as well. Uh, if you're going to select the plant material, it should be native plants. Um, and then basically uh, for all soils, if you're going to be planting anything, you really should test it, take samples and test it, uh, determine the pH and the nutrient le levels, uh, especially if you're going to be planting on fertilization. Um, you want to make sure that it actually needs the fertilizer. Uh, excess nitrogen, as I mentioned earlier, can cause problems in drinking water, uh, saltwater ecosystems. Nitrogen actually creates algae blooms in salt water, while phosphorus creates the uh, algae blooms in fresh water. Uh, excess phosphorus can also accelerate the aging process. So again, that's what we were talking about uh, with these algae blooms. Uh, excess nitrogen and potassium oxide can burn and just kill the grass right off. Uh, and if there is any going to be any fertilization, fertilizer applications, it needs to be done in accordance with the nutrient runoff law. Um, that came out in 1912, or yeah, 2012. Uh, so be aware there are, there are rules and regulations trying to control the use and uh, placement of uh, fertilization just because of those damage that it can do. When it comes to PEC, the first line of defense is basically preventing that erosion. That's kind of what we're talking about now. Uh, and once it breaks loose and starts to travel, then you've got to try to control that sediment. Uh, so um, it's a lot easier to try to control these on small scale projects, areas, uh, than to try to take a whole mountainside and try to control the runoff on that. Uh, so smaller scale projects and disturbances are uh, more ideal as far as controlling. They mentioned soil compaction. Yes, yeah, part of that soil stabilization, we really need to try to stabilize it in a better way. Uh, this is basically one of the tools that they've got out there to rip that soil. Again, depends on the type of equipment that's out there. Uh, that's being compacted on the soil, but you need to get down there uh, below that area just to break that soil up and allow that infiltration in the roots to take hold. Um, it is required for redevelopment on larger developments. In this case, you can see out here where it's basically this all the soil has been compacted uh, and very little is growing. And that's because from that, that the cause of that typically is over compaction. Uh, and it will affect the whole post construction hydrology. Um, so decompaction of a development site to return to the original porosity, properties and porosity of the soil. Um, that'll help reduce run, runoff, that'll help provide filtering of the pollutants from the soil. Um, so again, um, breaking that soil up, re, re, soil restoring that soil and getting it back into its natural state. Is, uh, again, it's a required thing uh, for a larger problem, projects. So just keep that in mind, compaction can do substantial amount of damage. And again, another tool that's out there that can be used for ripping that soil. Topsoiling, basically the spreading of topsoil materials on graded areas provide an acceptable plant coverage. Um, once you can get that in there, it'll help reduce erosion. Again, a good topsoil is gonna have uh, six to 20% organic matter in it. And that helps bind that material together. So it's gonna reduce that uh, erosion. Um, it's gonna reduce field, uh, fertilization needs as well if it's good topsoil. Uh, and the irrigation because that organic matter is going to hold the moisture a little bit better. Um, and a lot of times it's required. That's why a lot of times you'll see uh, stockpiles of the existing topsoil on site. Um, just trying to reuse that. 
As far as top applications, again, the Blue Book's got this information in there, again, depending on your site conditions, uh, conditions if you've got deep sand or loamy sand, uh, deep sandy loam, six inches or more of silt loam, clay loam, or loam or just silt, um, and the attendant use, what do you plan on doing with it? Mowing it, unmowing it. Um, it there's a recommendation based on that, on the, the minimum depth of topsoil. So again, the Blue Book's got a lot of information in there that's worth worth looking through. They've updated the Blue Book from 2016. Uh, it's a little bit easier to follow. Uh, it's very concise. It's got a lot of information. In there. So don't be afraid to look at it. It's available on the, on the website. It's also a link on there on our handout. Seeding is extremely important. Again, we want to try to reestablish that vegetation. Um, ideally, you want perennial material on there, a perennial vegetation, meaning that it's going to reach your regerminate every year. Uh, but typically a lot of times you may just want annuals on there just to get it going. So a mixture of annuals and perennial vegetation on there, the, the annuals will grow quick and help stabilize it immediately while the, veg, the perennial vegetation get, gets an opportunity to take root. Um, typically it's required in uh, inactive areas, as I mentioned earlier, uh, anything greater than 14 days typically needs to be stabilized. Um, yeah, and it can reduce that soil loss by up to 90%. And it's one of the most cost-effective uh, erosion control measures that are out there, just putting grass seed out there. Uh, it may be compacted soil as well, so you may have to decompact that as well. Rake and scarify the surface before you seed, get it so it takes that soil, and then maybe track it down, walk, it, uh, walk the seed in and stabilize it a little bit. And it is okay to apply uh, seed before snow. Uh, the idea is that it will germinate in the spring before the soil dries out. So again, seeding, getting that vegetation back on there, uh, very important. Again, the Blue Book has a variety of different types of um, specifications as far as seeding and planting. And uh, this right here is special, standard specifications for vegetating waterways if you've got wet areas. Um, again, this person, it's got the mixtures, it's got application rates um, to, to get the best product. <clears throat> Again, another table within the blue book, basically permanent construction area planting mixture recommendations. Uh, talks about seed mixtures, a uh, variety of plants that are in there, and again, the rate of application. Um, and worth considering. Again, gives you kind of a guide on some of the plants that you might want to go instead of just going buying seed at the store and not really knowing what you're getting. Um, it's worthwhile looking at some of these things and looking at what's out there. Uh, again, recreational seed mixes as well. Again, we want that vegetation in there. If it's going to be a perennial uh, vegetation, we want that to regenerate every year and restabilize and basically develop that root growth in there. Um, if you don't have time for seeding, sod is always a good option. Basically, it's rolled grass turf. Uh, it imme immediately stabilizes the, uh, that area. Uh, it helps filter the runoff immediately. It's a quick cover. Uh, it enhances the beauty. And it can be installed late in the season. Um, in case it's not, you no, know, you don't have time to basically allow that plant, the, the seed to germinate. Another option would be uh, um, hydro seeding, which is basically a slurry mixture of grass, uh, vegetation seed, mulch, fertilizer, and water. Uh, these, well, the seeding you're going to use will depend on the soil, the slope, and the region, obviously. Um, and again, you want it to vary for quick growth and then long-term growth as well. Uh, mulch typically is recycled paper, wood fibers, cotton products um, that are used for adhesion, and they help hold that moisture in there. On steep slopes, um, they'll add a lot of times they'll add fiber bond matrix seeds, matrix or some flexible growth media, uh, which could be wood fibers and tactifiers basically to hold it to the slope. As far as maintenance, basically once you put these in here, you definitely want to go and uh, not walk away. You want to come back and inspect it, make sure that vegetation is growing. If there's any erosion, identify it and take care of it. Uh, reseed is necessary and add water is required. And if you're applying these things, you want to put them on pretty heavily. Again, this is going to serve as a protection cover for the seed um, so the rain doesn't wash it away. Mulching does the same thing basically for erosion control. Um, it, it protects the seed, uh, can certainly that layer of mulch over top, conserves the moisture. Uh, by conserving the moisture underneath that layer, basically it's going to lessen the temperature fluctuations. Uh, it'll break that raindrop velocity. 
Um, and then they can be either temporary or uh, permanent. Again, in this case, in the picture on the right, it's going to be a temporary biodegradable uh, material. Uh, but you can put stone up and we'll touch on that too. Uh, of course, uh, try to stabilize the slope before it gets vegetated. Um, compost filter soft or mulch filter soft. Uh, it's a temporary practice where uh, basically it allows it to filter the sediment and other pollutants and prevent migrations. Uh, what you're trying to do is try to minimize any kind of uh, channelization. Uh, typically, it'll intercept uh, se sediment laden runoff. Uh, it's designed for sheet flow. Uh, so you would install it on the contour, similar to a silt fence. Um, the flow will come down the ends. If you'll notice, they turn them up a little bit. Uh, that's to prevent any kind of runoff channeling and going around it and creating a problem later on. And typically, they're designed for a six-month uh, design life, uh, typically not a final tool. This was a picture we took out in Montana. It is, uh, looks like it's a little more than six months, but as an example. Uh, they can also be used manufactured, other manufactured types, flexible, they, they, can be, uh, they are flexible, uh, they can be reused. Um, again, it's going to depend on the slow, uh, the slope. Uh, you don't want high velocity in there, it's going to wash them away and destroy them, but on lower gradients, um, oh, you can install these things, it's going to slow the velocity, it's going to collect that sediment going through. And this is just a close-up of it, kind of look through, they've got that biodegradable material in here with the mesh on the outside. Uh, typically, you know, these things become sediment laden. You can just basically cut them, um, take them off site here, cut them and just spread them out. It's all organic material, so it's easy to maintain, easy to get rid of. And that if they're not full of sediment, you can reuse them. Uh, loose stabilization blankets. If you've put mulch and other materials down on top of there, maybe topsoil, uh, you want to drape it with some sort of stabilization blankets to protect that. You, you put the mulch and uh, the topsoil, whatever compost materials down, and you would seed it, and then you would put these materials over it. And the idea is basically you're protecting that surface and just stabilizing it. And again, it's going to be slope dependent. <clears throat> Erosion control blankets, again, as they come, they come in a variety of different things. Um, and the idea is to be able to stabilize, protect that surface, and allow it to revegetate. In this case, you can see they've added topsoil underneath here. Hopefully they vegetated and then they rolled their um, roche control blanket over top of it. So you see they've staked, they've got a stat pattern here with um, nailing it down to hold it on that surface as well. Uh, so it, essentially it does the same thing as mil, uh, the mulch. It protects that seed area, controls the temperature uh, and promotes that growth. Um, common uses are on steep slopes, basically more than three to one. Again, there's a variety of different kinds. Um, so if you're thinking of using some kind of erosion control blanket, uh, understand what you want out of it. The single layer material, basically it's biodegradable. It's got a life of about 12 months. Um, typically on three quarter to one slopes, doesn't, it's not necessarily the strongest, but um, for mild grades and roadside slopes, it works pretty well. Uh, typically it's got the, uh, the straw in it if it's only gonna last 12 months or so. There's a double layer of it, which basically it's also biodegradable. It goes for 12 to 24 months. Uh, you can use them on slopes two to one. Um, typical type, you can use them in moderate flow channels, but not too. If you get a high flow, it's going to shear them. Uh, but again, it's intended to uh, improve stabilization. Typically, if you've got 12 to 24 months, it's going to be a combination of uh, straw and the coconut fiber uh, weaved together, and that'll give it its length. Um, then there's a permanent material, typically this green stuff. It's a polypropylene material. Um, you can use them in high flow channels, uh, helps stabilize the roots, um, protects against the high shear. Again, that's, that's why you can use them in channels. Um, so a variety of different ones that are out there. Uh, take, take a kid, consider it and take into consideration. And they do with their length and their life intended. Uh, will increase with price. So be aware of what you need it for. Get what you need. Not buy something that's just uh, just out there because it is. Um, again, it's uh, when you're putting these down on all slopes greater than three to one or steeper, or in flow channels, you need to stabilize them. Need, they need to be anchored. Um, so uh, be aware of that. So that's again, that's a new dis, uh, new requirement in the uh, the blue book. And this is just an example of one of the hotel. This is actually a hotel in uh, Oneana. Uh, they had put it up. This is the fall of the year, so they put these material on here to try to stabilize the seed uh, over in the back. 
Um, there's also the version here. They put up a the version trench around here to keep the runoff in the back coming down over it. They built that over here and then they've channeled it over here. And I'll talk about that. In a minute. Just wanted to point that out. So how do you install these things? Essentially, uh, it's pretty straightforward. You're going to dig a trench at the top. You're going to want to put your material in it. And then you want to backfill that and compact it. And that's going to hold that top in place. And then just essentially roll it down the hill and then staple it, nail it down. Uh, pretty straightforward, uh, a little bit of time and effort. But uh, again, uh, the idea is to try to protect that so to keep it from eroding away. Uh, vegetated rock gabions are basically um, gabion mattresses with uh, stones in them. Obviously, these are riverbank stones, uh, but there's no real intent of expecting them to roll. So what they do is kind of mix uh, the stone with some um, uh, organic material or soil, uh, and it vegetates over top of it so that the stone and the, uh, the mesh basically hold, uh, the gabions basically hold the slope, and then uh, the vegetation on top basically takes it, takes that, um, you know, industrial look away from it. It gives it kind of a good look and it helps improve um, the infiltration and everything else on there. So again, just different options that are out there. And this is a new one uh, that's been added to the 2016 uh, Blue Book. Uh, armored slope and channel stabilization. This is basically, um, they had two of the same practices who were nearly similar. So they basically, they combined the former riprap slope protection and stream bank protection standards. Um, and they call it the armored slope stabilization, channel stabilization. And again, these are, again, pretty straightforward. Again, slope dependent, the rock material is gonna be dependent on that. Um, and speaking of the rock, again, armored slope protection is gonna depend on how slope, how, what the angle of that slope is. Okay. If you ever uh, took a bucket of sand and you just poured it out, you're gonna have like a little cone that's true there. That angle of that cone is basically the angle of repose, uh, the degree at which it can stand on its own. And it's going to depend basically on the material itself. Uh, down here is 31 degrees and up here is 41 degrees, 43 degrees. You can see the crushed rock because it interlocks with itself is going to be able to go to a much steeper slope. Uh, angular rock, it does some interlocking as well and you're not going to get as much uh, of a slope out of it. But, and then there's rounded rock, as I pointed out in that mattress before. Uh, the rounded rock doesn't have that much of a slope because once it gets there, it tends to roll. Um, one of the drawbacks with rounded rock as well in any kind of uh, flow channel situation is that it, it will roll. Instead of pushing and holding back against the forces of the water, it'll just roll with it and keep moving. And this is basically a small diagram on how these things are constructed. Essentially, you've got your slope. Uh, I guess up to 1.5 to 1, you can do your slope be greater than that, it's gonna use some sort of stability analysis. And then you get your, either your gravel or you use the fab, fiber fab, uh, filter cloth. And then you put your material here. Typically the thickness of the material, uh, the T here is gonna be, uh, is gonna be equal to 1.5, uh, one and a half times the largest piece of stone that you're putting in there. Uh, down at the bottom, there's gonna be a toe here, two foot by three foot. And basically that's designed to hold this slope from pushing down. Um, it does, it, it helps keep the stable here. It, it's, it's good for, um, if you've got a weeping and water flow coming out of the soil or a spring coming out of the soil, um, this will work well to prevent that from eroding out and washing it out and causing um, rills and sloughs coming down through the hill. But it won't, what they won't do is prevent, prevent um, the slope itself from sliding or uh, any kind of slope failure. It's just basically try to stabilize that slope. So it's not really stopping the slope from falling. Um, so just be aware of that, basically you're protecting that slope and allowing that weeping material to flow through. Another uh, practice that's out there is the vegetated gabion walls, rock gabion walls, basically gabion baskets. Again, they've added organic materials around it and through it uh, to promote that vegetation to grow into it. Uh, basically, it's a combination of vegetation, rock, and gabions. Um, it basically provides a, a plant canopy to reduce runoff, uh, decreases the temperature, the stone is going to collect temperature. So with the vegetation over it, uh, it's going to reduce that potential for the stone to collect temperature, um, which in turn, when the stone gets hot and the rain falls on it, that temperature increases as well. So you're reducing that potential for uh, temperature issues in the runoff of the water. Um, 
And again, it's used for different types of things, steep slopes, road cuts, slump areas, gully cuts, slow fill areas, um, areas subject to erosion, seepage, and weathering, um, and have a low to medium hazard potential. Uh, again, you don't want something that's gonna create a high hazard. And the Blue Book's got designs as well for this. Um, you know, types of material to use, the fill, the, the plantings, uh, how to stack it, where to put it. So again, they've got guidelines for that as well. This is an example basically of a, a runoff ditch coming out of a, uh, multiple fields coming through. They put these gabion baskets here. It's gonna help flow that flow down once it hits a stone, but it's also gonna help filtrate, uh, allow that water to filtrate through that uh, stone itself. And by doing so, it's gonna slow it down. With some larger embankments, you use those baskets to stay, stack them up. Um, I'm kind of curious about this one here. It looks like these baskets are kind of bulging and it looks like there's no batter on them. It looks like they're coming toward the road. Uh, if you're gonna install anything on this, you should have some sort of uh, back slope to it. So it leans back and not forward. Uh, I think we saw with this here too, you can see there's a batter on here. Uh, typically a 12 degree batter or something like that is gonna keep it from falling out and stepping it back as well. Uh, in this case here, it could be a little bit precarious. It might require some additional thinking on that, but I don't know enough about it to really place an opinion on that, but um, it can be used. Again, those gabion baskets can be useful. Slower situations, maybe just a simple retaining wall, uh, segmented retaining wall. Again, as the larger you get, you can actually put fabric to reach back through the back of these and help stabilize that as well. Uh, all of these are going to need some sort of drainage behind them, uh, sub subsurface drainage. You want to reduce that potential for hydrostatic pressure behind these walls. And channel stabilization, basically uh, formally stream bank um, protection. And they can be gabions, riprap, precast concrete, grid pavers. Um, if you're gonna do anything in a stream, you're gonna have to submit a stream disturbance permit and get approvals uh, prior to going in there. Um, but again, it allows you to restore and maintain and improve some of the aquatic life that's out there. Um, the riprap is going to be sized based on the velocity, the potential large velocity of the flow. Um, so again, just different types of things that are out there. Um, just be aware. Again, another detail on how some of this might work along the channel sound stabilization along a, uh, a waterway. Uh, for the slope, it's slightly different, but the waterway, again, you've got your little toes here and your protection, um, your, your toe here and then your thickness. And, uh, your materials and again, same kind of concept. Other practices are basically mechanic or uh, manufactured practices that are out there. Um, you've got these grids, paver grids you can basically pick up. These these are very expensive ways to go, but you've got these grid pavers. Um, again, I've seen them used along ocean shores and shorelines there. Uh, again, the gabions are useful as well. Um, and then you've got your uh, modular cribbings, basically precast modular units, and they've come out with interlocking, interlocking blocks as well. Uh, again, these are all identified within the blue book as well. So again, more information if needed. Uh, and sometimes you just have to build a retaining wall. Uh, again, you're gonna want an engineer to make sure that works and it's properly and stabilized and just put on a good firm foundation. Uh, it's got drainage behind it. But again, sometimes that might be your only option. So when it comes to mitigating runoff, um, there's several ways we can do it. We can divert the flow away. Um, basically, water flow pass. You can be control, controlled basically to deliver the water to an outlet at the side or at the bottom of the slope. Uh, with diversion, you can redirect flow through shallow ditches or diversion across and above disturbed areas. Uh, diversions can intercept and carry water away from the slope. You can contain flow on site or off site. Uh, ideally, if there's water coming from uh, runoff from offsite, uh, if you can put these diversion flows around it, um, it'll take that water. It, it'll allow you to continue to work without having to deal with that runoff coming down through your site. Um, I mean, obviously, in all these things, you need to be considering on where the, that discharge is going to be. If you're going to be able to diversion panel uh, channel, you, see, you need to take into consideration where that uh, where it's going to go. Larger slopes are going to require different practices. And subsurface drainage is always important um, when it comes to kind of controlling. It'll protect uh, you know, long-term saturation it'll, uh, and reduce potential for sloughing. 
Um, and then there's structural controls. It could be temporary or permanent. Um, but again, different types of things that are out there. There's earthen structures that you're using as kind of part of uh, diversion. Um, you wanna make sure those are completely stabilized uh, and considered functional before you decide you're gonna plan, um, plan on using them. Uh, a minor diversion uh, is basically just a water bar. Uh, this is basically something you will put across the road. There's your lane goes this way. Uh, basically it's a diagonal down slope. Uh, or you collect any kind of runoff here that protect, keeps it from uh, channelizing and creating large ruts in the roadway. Collecting it, discharging it here into some sort of stable outlet. Again, that's going to help any sediment and decrease the velocity as it goes through. And this is a picture of some, uh, a water bar here, but it's, it's actually pretty poor. I've got to get a new one of those. But as far as diversions, they come in a variety of different things. Again, they can be per permanent or temporary. Um, again, verting off-site drainage uh, on an active site might consider something like this. Um, and what it'll do is reduce the amount of water runoff flowing through the construction site. Typically, they're not permanent. Um, you can uh, line them with uh, stone or fabric. In this case, it looks like the, uh, the straw coconut material has been stapled down through there. Um, and if you're going to put stone in there, again, it's going to be based on the flow velocity. Uh, the stone's got to be able to withstand the force of that flow. And it can be temporary, just um, perimeter protections. And there's not a whole lot to this one. Uh, I don't believe it gets a whole lot of runoff anyway, but again, just a precaution. And then this is an on-site um, diversion dent, uh, trench, basically trying to collect the water from an existing area uh, and diverting it to another area within the site itself. Again, on large areas, you can do that. Um, that motel I pointed out earlier, they built, as I mentioned earlier, they built a, um, a diversion trench up above and as the velocity increased, they put it into this stone line ditch uh, and then discharged it out into the, uh, the county's drainage system. Even small scale, where it's channeled through here to prevent any kind of rail, you can see some of the rail big form in here. So they've kind of built a little berm here and rechanneled re it to go down through this little stone area into the ditch itself. Again, just try to consider which it, where it's going, uh, impacts it's gonna have before it gets here. What are we doing with time? Mm -hmm. Not too good. All right, diversion, again, different types of options, again, where you're gonna be, the type of soil you're gonna have, uh, the type of cover you're gonna have on there, um, some of the retardant factors um, for various grasses and legumes out there. So you know, if you're looking for different types of material, plants, situations, um, soils, uh, there's a variety of different options that are available in the Blue Book. Now uh, they've got details for some of these diversion swells, temporary and permanent. Again, pretty straightforward, but uh, you know, they're out there. In some cases, you got to build some heavy duty ones, um, you know, basically bypassing something that you're working on underneath, whatever it might be. Some of these can be pretty permanent structures. These are Jersey barriers lined with plastic. Um, so again, there's the different options that are out there. And again, this is just trying to divert water away from a situation, try to minimize any potential for erosion. Uh, grade stabilization structures, on the other hand, uh, they again can be permanent or uh, temporary, but essentially what these do is basically as that flow comes down here, instead of that water flowing through here in a smooth accelerating manner, every time it drops, it loses energy, flows, drops, loses energy, and that maintains its velocity so it doesn't become erosive. Uh, they can be larger ones. They can, they can be made out of just stone. They can be out of wood. Um, they can be something as simple as a stone line ditch and creating that friction there to slow that uh, velocity down. <clears throat> In some cases, maybe even check dams. Uh, the check dam basically the flow is forced to go through the check dam and uh, sediments collected as it goes through there, but it slows that velocity down substantially. And so again, so if you can slow that velocity of that flow down, you're going to get a lot more, a uh, lot more survival out of your ditches and uh, your bankments. Vertical drops, again, similar to these grade structures, um, basically dropping it. Every time it drops, it loses momentum. It dissipates that energy. Uh, so instead of having a torrent coming through here, it's just kind of kind of a bunch of series of waterfalls that are going to decrease its flow and reduce that velocity. Again, the same on the right. 
uh, stabilize it. Uh, this was down, this photo on the left here was basically down on uh, Route 1786 where they put the Parkfield construction and they built, they did, did a bypass for the new structure. Um, and they've got rocks, uh, basically sheer rock up above. Uh, so what they did was built a diversion channel above it and then they needed to drop it down here. So they took those Gadian mattresses, uh, filled them with stone, channelized it. And that basically carries that runoff down through this a stone line ditch below. Uh, so different options you can have here. Uh, this here is going to take a left as it goes through um, in this middle picture. Again, something to stop that flow and help it turn. So again, stabilizing it, protecting it, keeping that sediment from being exposed essentially to uh, the soil and protecting that soil be from becoming sediment. Uh, even, in, even in streams and ditches, you can use the fabric, stake it down. Um, again, another benefit of trying to reduce that but scour through that channel. Uh, outlet protection, they've got these thicker uh, rubber mat materials uh, that can be used. Essentially what it does is allow the roots to grow up through them. The heavy storms will knock the plants over, but the roots will remain and they'll grow back. Uh, and a more mellow uh, approach with the, or just the grass line swales, basically a wide shallow channel uh, adjacent to the ground level. Um, and it's stabilized by vegetation, it conveys runoff without causing erosion. Uh, if erosion does occur, if the flow gets too heavy, you can always add a check dam to slow it down. But the velocity and uh, the vegetation itself slows that velocity down. And again, when it comes to everything is based on velocity because that velocity is going to have that force that's going to cause things to shear. Uh, so there's limits on what you can put the grass line swales here. Um, but on the line swales, uh, water-wise, um, this is basically feet per second. As you can see, with five feet per section, you need an average size, uh, maximum size of six inch stone. But once you get up to 12 feet per second, 15% feet per second, that's 24, 36 inch stone. That's, and now you need to think of something else. It can become extremely prohibitive when you got to put it down 1.5 times the depth. So uh, again, there are limits to it, but there are other options as well. And this is just basically a kind of a simple sketch Again, they want to spread it out. The wider it is, the less channel it's going to be and the slower it's going to flow in both cases. Line waterways, this is something that uh, the state had done out, uh, out uh, just west of Green after Irene and Lee came through, took the whole you know, concrete line channel here, essentially the flow came through and just ripped that concrete line channel right out. So they've come back and opened it up and put this in here. And, uh, been very effective. It's actually grown back now and it actually looks pretty good. Another options, this was done up in Washington County. They had a stone line ditch um, that was getting heavier flow than they had anticipated. So we ended up coming through and they put a slurry mixture down through it, obviously when it was dry. Um, in line that ditch with the slurry mixture and uh, it's helped stabilizing it. It's capturing some of the sediment and runoff going through here, but it's slowing that velocity down. Um, so it's doing its work. Uh, another way of flowing that velocity down is a flow diffuser, essentially just taking a channel flow and spreading it out over a larger area. And ideally you're gonna slow that down to where it's gonna be able to infiltrate back in. Um, different types of setups that are through there. Uh, again, the idea is spread that channel flow out, disperse it, and uh, ideally it's gonna infiltrate into the ground. Uh, it's the same concept of riprap outlet or uh, uh, you know, plunge pools, whatever out there, the idea that the flow will come out, uh, dissipate into the stone and then infiltrate back in there. This is kind of a diagram of what a flow diffuser is. You're taking that concentrated flow, spreading it out, and ideally allowing it to infiltrate back in anything that doesn't, you're putting it back into that channel. But you're trying to reduce the velocity, you're trying to reduce the volume. Um, and then they've got details as well. Blue Book has several of these in their diagrams. Um, again, don't be afraid to use that book. It's very useful. Uh, pipe slope drains are another method of getting uh, runoff over an area. Uh, essentially, if you've got water coming off of the surface area up top here, um, instead of reeling it out and causing all kinds of erosion on the slope, basically to capture it and run it down through a pipe. Uh, ideally, they should have some sort of riprap flow dissipator at the bottom. Um, but not in this case. But again, it, it uh, kind of illustrates what's going on here. Uh, they, again, they can be temporary or permanent. This was out west. Um, this is basically a parking area where they're collecting the runoff coming through here. This is the backside. Basically, they're just putting that flow 
using that pipe drain to get past that rocky flow to avoid washing out under the road and just shedding it away. In a diagram, again, this is in the uh, it's in our stormwater magazine, but it's also in the blue book as well. Um, the outlet protection, again, the same concept, slow that water down. As that flow goes through those culverts from a ditch, typically it gets into, from the ditch, it, it's got to decrease its total area to get through that culvert. And to do that, to keep the maintain uh, the same volume going through there, the water's got to accelerate. So as it comes out that pipe, it can be coming out substantially faster. And that's what this riprop is designed to do, basically slow that flow down and decrease that potential for erosion. There are several biotechnical practice, basically specialized use of woody plant materials to stabilize the soil and enhance the structure, um, and then provide supported, uh, support to the habitat. Vegetative cover is a factor that affects the erosion. The more cover the soil has, the more protected it is. Um, these, tech, these biotechnical measures typically generally uh, combine basic engineering principles with plant science and create a system of stability and resource management in critical areas, such as stream banks, road slopes and large exposed areas. And they can combine structural measures to affect the strengthening of the soil. Um, and they combine them with vegetation. As I mentioned, there are several of them. Uh, typically, if you get these kind of sloth areas up here, uh, they can be hard. In this case, they didn't use any deal, uh, erosion control blankets. Uh, but depending on how the sloth may have occurred, it might have been a spring underneath. Um, one of the ways of protecting that is basically branch packing. If you've got this sloth here, um, you're going to take that existing material that's fallen out and just start layering branches, live cuttings, typically willows, and compacting them and staking them. Um, used for small repairs, alternate layers, and then compact it. Uh, typically limited to a four foot depth and a six foot width. Uh, and it's not really a structural stabilization, but it does help hold that uh, material where it is. Uh, branch layering, again, another method basically you're cutting uh, steps into the bank and you're cutting putting uh, typically live branches and then typically willows. Uh, you're gonna layer them horizontally. As you see, it can be done uh, earth or you can use wood underneath and then you just wanna kind of interlock them as you're planting them, as you're laying them in there and covering them up. Or you can use, you can place them on wooden and then you wanna hammer these back. Ideally, you wanna get that to the back of that slope and then layer on top of them. Uh, the fiber roll, again, typical, uh, we saw earlier, in this case, they're using it in the, so along a stream bank here to help stabilize. Uh, basically, it's one of those koi logs that are basically got organic material in it, and you're staking it in and backing up. In this case, they basically set them up in tiers, horizontal, um, along the contours, and they flatten the vegetation behind them. Ideally, that vegetation is going to take root and help stabilize that slope. And it's really the, how it's put in is pretty much straightforward. Um, you're staking the, 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 uh, the koi log right in there, the fiber roll of whatever it might be. Maybe you put a plant within it as well, but behind it, you back it up. That helps stabilize the slope behind, and it gives those plantings the ability to take a root hold. Um, and then you can use these in combination. You've got a structural wall below of stone can resist some of that forces that are coming through in a, along a stream bank, but then they've got this uh, fiber roll that comes across, then they got the branch layering, more fiber roll and branch layering. And ultimately the idea is that it's gonna take root and that whole upper area is gonna be stabilized by the vegetation itself. Uh, crib walls, using live crib walls is another option. Uh, hollow it's a hollow box-like structure with interlocking untreated logs or timbers. You spike them together and anchor it in the slope. Then you fill it with suitable material uh, in layers of live branch cuttings. Branch cuttings. Uh, again, protects the eroded and exposed stream banks from erosive forces. Um, ideally, if you're going to use it, the flows need to be less than six feet per second um, and no degradation in the stream bank itself. This is kind of an example of what one looks like. Um, well, I think this is more of a uh, fiber material uh, crib wall. But again, they've got the vegetation growing in here and again, working together is going to create themselves a, a strengthened structure that's going to be mostly organic. Lyophacines are another. Um, typically, you're going to use native materials, native branches, uh, maximum diameter of one inch to those little strands. So you're going to create a four to eight inch diameter bundle, eight, 15 feet long. And essentially, you're going to put dig in little trenches and you're going to stake them back in there uh, and backfill. 
and they're going to work like little mini check dams, essentially to, uh, cutting that flow as it goes down through there. Uh, ideally, as it comes through, it's, the water's going to flow down through and get through these material here. And this is just kind of them building some of them right now. Um, you can see they're tying them together and stuffing them in the ditch. So again, different things. And ultimately, again, they, they then tend to take root. And again, you'd want to use them along the contours on road cuts, slumps, fill areas, gullies, stream banks. So another option that are out there, live stakes are another one. Um, used to repair smaller slips and slumps. Uh, typically used in wet, wet soil or when exposed to stream, uh, stream banks. And it's basically what you can see, basically you've got your live stakes stuffed in through the stone. Um, live stakes basically just one third, two third, one third out, two third in. You should have a, uh, a leaf on it of some sort um, to, to ensure that it's alive. This is kind of what some of those stakes look like, just stuffed into the ground. And then it'll take off. Here's a close up. Ideally, again, they, these plants are going to take root. Again, the top, square cut, minimum of two buds on top, a third up. You've got your grade, you want to tamp around it. And then the angle here, this is one of the more important things is the angle here. Does the life of a branch basically exists around the perimeter, around the cambium layer of the bark? Uh, so, the more, so if you cut it on an angle, there's more of that. Um, that rim around that um, branch is going to be exposed. It will improve its potential for survival. <clears throat> With maintenance, um, again, it's, if you control that sediment, uh, your maintenance should be minimal. You shouldn't have to dig your ditches every year. Um, if you can maintain them and just take out the, the, the sediment that has been laid in there, try to preserve some of the, the vegetation that's there. It's going to keep it stabilized. Uh, if you do end up uh, having to clean out your ditches, um, it is recommended that you have, uh, reach out to your soil and water and uh, work with them uh, to try to be there right after you do that. Because once you've exposed that soil, if you let it sit for five, 10 days, it's going to evaporate. The soil is going to get dry. It's going to start to slump. Uh, it's going to be substantially harder for um, the vegetation to take root. So if you've um, conducted your ditching and your cleaning, and you can get soil and water in there with a hydro seeder, which most of them have, um, they can help hydro seed that and help stabilize it as you go. Um, well, it's worth reaching out to your soil and water people to see if you can work with them. Again, they're there to help. Uh, or even your ditches, just cutting them back and make sure and keeping them clean, make sure that they don't erode out, keeping an eye on them. You know, doing regular inspections after every major storm, remove the debris, uh, check the sediment accumulating, accumulations, repair any eroded areas, replace any stones. So several things that can be done. Uh, again, the idea is you want to reduce that velocity, whether it's through your stream, through stones, uh, check bands, um, grade, uh, grade dropping structures here as it comes down. And you can't always do this, but there are options. So um, you know, just to be aware of the, if you can slow that velocity down, um, you're going to have a lot more success in stabilizing soil and keeping it where it needs to be. Uh, as far as stabilizing, again, it's got the erosion control blankets, a variety of different types. Now it's going to depend on whether you want a permanent or not, the slope that's on it. Um, if you're going to use some of these polypropylene material uh, and you plan on using it, you don't want to use them in the same place. Uh, if you plan on mowing it, I should say. Because this polypropylene material is typically permanent and it will wrap up in your mower. So um, just be aware there are things out there. Mulching again, protect that seed and encourage that growth. Uh, the same with the hydro seeding. Jeff, you uh, got a question in the Q&A. Um, are live stakes readily available and are they more deciduous trees uh, or shrub type plants? Uh, the live stakes are typically um, Ideally, what they say is if you could find uh, some local willows, find somewhere where you can get the local willows, whether it's a nursery or find somebody that has them. Um, typically, you will cut them uh, because typically you'll use them in a wet environment. So they're typically a, des a deciduous shrub or a tree. Uh, the willows, some red twig dogwoods, variety of plants like that are the type that they're looking for. Um, and they can be uh, readily available from nature. I've got a I got a slew of them in my yard I'm going to cut down, but um, yeah, they, they pretty much grow wild. If you, and if you can't get them directly, you can get them at a nursery and that kind of stuff. Um, so they are available, uh, whether they're native or not. Uh, ideally, if you can use those native species, you're going to get a lot more life out of them. 
I hope that answers your question. Type in if I didn't. <laughs> but again, if you can stabilize your soil, that's the key to keeping that erosion from going anywhere um, and reducing your maintenance later on. And uh, that was essentially it. Um, we could put up some of our PDH questions and we'll kind of go through them. It's like I'm a few minutes over at this point. Uh, what is the first line of defense in managing stormwater runoff? Prevent erosion, stop sedimentation, eliminate pollutants, erosion control blankets. Looks like we have a favorite. I would have to say everybody got that one right. Prevent the erosion before he even starts going. Again, that's your best line of defense. Don't let it happen. You know, once it happens, then you've got a job trying to stop it, save it. Next one, steep slopes are easier to maintain because the velocity of the flow makes the runoff goes faster. True or false? It's like we've got a hundred on this one too. Well, we have one person that picked the true. Uh, that's actually false. Steep slopes are difficult for me because of that velocity. Uh, that runoff, the faster it goes, the more potential it has for erosion. Uh, so yeah, the, again, slowing that velocity off is gonna help you uh, help stabilize that a lot better and a lot easier. Let's question three. Biotechnical stabilization includes mechanical and vegetative methods to help stabilize. True or false? All right, true, everybody got that right. And basically using mechanical structural means and combining it with vegetative measures to uh, try to promote that root growth in there as well um, to further that strength of that, that whole structure. All right, number four, which of the following does not influence erosion? Soil erodibility, vegetative cover, topography, or none of the above? Yeah, it would be none of the above. Soil erodibility is basically its vulnerability to, uh, to erode. Uh, so basically it is part of that texture, it's part of the soil structure. Uh, so it will, it will influence um, erosion. So these top three will influence erosion. The bottom one is basically none of the above. You have another one? All right, four type, there are only four types of erosion, raindrop, surface, rill, and gully erosion. That was actually a trick question. <laughs> Those are the only four we've talked about, but there's also ice, there's gravity, there's wind. So that answer would have been false. There's several multiple types of erosion. Uh, these four types are the only ones we talked about here today, uh, but that was just a blurb in the beginning. And I think this is the last one. Erosion is a new concept, which is why it is so difficult to manage. Yeah. <laughs> 
That one is false. Obviously, with that picture of the Grand Canyon, it's been around for a long time. Not that we've been trying to manage it, but it's still difficult to manage. All right, is that, I think that's it. That's all. All right. Well, I thank everybody for participating. If you have any questions, by all means, reach out to us. Uh, we don't know the answer right off the top. We could certainly get back to you with an answer. Uh, again, what can I help, trying to help you here? And uh, yeah, again, let us know if you have any questions. Uh, you can contact me directly or you can contact the office, and emails, phone calls, whatever it might be.